Hello and welcome to Pulp Today. This week I'll be heading down to San Diego Comic Con on Wednesday. That probably means there won't be a new episode next Monday unless I somehow figure out how to record one while I'm down there. But mostly next Monday I will be recovering and uh, drying out. As the saying goes, a little champagne, a little pre celebratory champagne. Uh, for reasons that will become clear when I start reading, today we are going to talk about a book called Inferno. Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, two great sci-fi writers. Um, in this book, they it's a great premise. A science fiction writer finds himself in the Inferno very much of Dante's Inferno of Dante's Divine Comedy, and it takes sort of a modern look at the philosophical question, why would God bother to operate a medieval torture chamber on dead souls? Seems like a little too much and a little too late, right? It's an interesting philosophical question. And uh, I myself took a shot at it in issues five through eight, of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. I did a little thing called uh, Elvira's Inferno, which was very much uh, inspired by this book. Uh, I read it not too long after it came out in 1976 and was very impressed by it. Uh, maybe my favorite thing of Niven's after uh, Ringworld. But I'm going to read the first uh, chapter and a little bit of the second chapter. They're both they're very short. For Dante Alighieri. Am I pronouncing that right? Alighieri. One. I thought about being dead. I could remember every silly detail of that last silly performance. I was dead at the end of it. But how could I think about being dead if I had died? I thought about that, too, after I stopped having hysterics. There was plenty of time to think. Call me Alan Carpentier. It's the name I wrote under, and someone will remember it. I was one of the best-known science fiction writers in the world, and I had a lot of fans. My stories weren't the kind that win awards, but they entertained, and I had written a lot of them. The fans all knew me. Someone ought to remember me. It was the fans that killed me. At least they let me do it. It's an old game. At science fiction conventions, the fans try to get their favorite author washed out, stinking drunk. Then they can go home and tell stories about how Alan Carpentier really tied one on, and they were right there to see it. They add to the stories until legends are built around what writers do at conventions. It's all in fun. They really like me, and I like them. I think I do. But the fans vote the Hugo Awards, and you have to be popular to win. I'd been nominated five times for awards and never won one, and I was out to make friends that year. Instead of hiding in a back booth with other writers, I was at a fan party, drinking with a room full of short, ugly kids with pimples, tall, serious Harvard types, girls with long, stringy hair, half-pretty girls, half-dressed to show it, and damn few people with good manners. Remember the drinking party in War and Peace? where one of the characters bets he can sit down on a window ledge and drink a whole bottle of rum without touching the sides. I made the same bet. The convention hotel was a big one, and the room was eight stories up. I climbed out and sat with my feet dangling against the smooth stone building. The smog had blown away, and Los Angeles was beautiful. Even when the, with the energy shortage, there were lights everywhere, moving rivers of lights on the freeways, blue glows from swimming pools near the hotel, a grid of light stretching out as far as I could see. Somewhere out there were fireworks, but I don't know what they were celebrating. They handed me the rum. You're a real sport, Alan, said a middle-aged adolescent. He had acne and halitosis, but he published one of the biggest science fiction newsletters around. He wouldn't have known a literary reference if it bit him on the nose. Hey, that's a long way down. Right. Beautiful night, isn't it? Arcturus up there. See it? Star with the largest proper motion. Moved a couple of degrees in the last 3,000 years. Almost races along. Carpentier's trivial last words, a meaningless lecture to people who not only knew it already, but had read it in my own work. 
I took the rum and tilted my head back to drink. It was like drinking battery acid. There was no pleasure in it. I'd regret this tomorrow, but the fans began, began to shout behind me, and that made me feel good. Till I saw why. Asimov had come in. Asimov wrote science articles and histories and straight novels and commentaries on the Bible and Byron and Shakespeare, and he turned out more material in a year than anyone else writes in a lifetime. I used to steal data and ideas from his columns. The fans were shouting for him, while I risked my neck to give them the biggest performance of all the drunken conventions of Alan Carpentier, with nobody watching. The bottle was half empty when my gag reflex cut in and spilled used rum into my nose and sinuses. I jackknifed forward to cough it out of my lungs and pitched right on over. I don't think anyone saw me fall. It was an accident, a stupid accident caused by stupid drunkenness, and it was all the fans' fault anyway. They had no business letting me do it. And it was an accident. I know it was. I wasn't feeling that sorry for myself. The city was alive with lights. A big Roman candle burst with brilliant pinpoints of yellows and greens against the starry skies. The view was pleasant as I floated down the side of the hotel. It seemed to take a long time to get to the bottom. Two. The big surprise was that I could be surprised, that I could be anything, that I could be. I was, but I wasn't. I thought I could see, but there was only a bright, uniform, metallic color of bronze. Sometimes there were faint sounds, but they didn't mean anything, and when I looked down I couldn't see myself. When I tried to move, nothing happened. It felt as if I had moved. My muscles sent the right position signals, but nothing happened. Nothing at all. I couldn't touch anything, not even myself. I couldn't feel anything or see anything or sense anything except my own posture. I knew when I was sitting or standing or walking or running or doubled up like a contortionist, but I felt nothing at all. I screamed. I could hear the scream, and I shouted for help. Nothing answered. Dead. I had to be dead. But dead men don't think about death. What did dead men think about? Dead men don't think. I was thinking, but I was dead. That struck me as funny and set off hysterics, and then I'd get myself under control and go round and round with it again. Dead. This is like nothing any religion had ever taught. Not that it ever caught any of the religions that were going around, but none of them warned of this. I certainly wasn't in heaven, and it was too lonely to be hell. It's like this, Carpentier. This is heaven, but you're the only one who made it. <laughs> I couldn't be dead. What then? Frozen? Frozen. That's it. They've made me a corpsicle. The convention was in Los Angeles, where the frozen dead movement started, and where it has the most supporters. They must have frozen me, put me in a double-walled coffin with liquid nitrogen all around me, and when they tried to revive me, the revival didn't work. What am I now? A brain in a bottle, fed by color-coded tubes? Why don't they try to talk to me? Why don't they kill me? Maybe they still have hopes of waking me. Hope. Maybe there's hope, after all. It was flattering, at first, to think of teams of specialists working to make me human again. The fans, they'd realized it was their fault, and they'd paid for this. How far in the future would I wake up? What would it be like? Even the definition of human might have changed. Would they have immortality? Stimulation of psychic power centers in the brain? Empires of thousands of worlds? I'd written about all of these, and my books would still be around. I'd be famous. I'd be written about... I'd written stories about future cultures raiding corpsicles for spare parts, transplants. Had that happened to me? My body broken up for spares? Then why was I still alive? Because they couldn't use my brain. Then let them throw it out. Maybe they just couldn't use it yet. Couldn't tell how long I was there. There was no sense of time passing. I screamed a lot. I ran nowhere forever to no purpose. I couldn't run out of breath. I never reached a wall. I wrote novels, dozens of them, in my head, with no way to write them down. I relived that last convention party a thousand times. I played games with myself. I remembered every detail of my life with brutal honesty I'd never had before. What else could I do? All through it, I was terrified of going mad, and then I'd fight the terror because that could drive me mad. I think I did not go mad, but it went on and on and on until I was screaming again. Get me out of here, please, anyone, someone, get me out of here. Nothing happened, of course. Pull the plug and let me die, make it stop, get me out of here. Nothing. Hey, Carpentier, remember the chill? 
Your hero was a corpsicle and they'd let his temperature drop too low. His nervous system had become a superconductor. Nobody knew he was alive in there, frozen solid, but thinking, screaming in his head, feeling the awful cold. No, for the love of God, get me out of here. I was lying on my left side in a field with dirt under me and warm light all around me. I was staring at my navel, and I could see it. It was the most beautiful sight I'd ever imagined. I was afraid to move. My navel and I might pop like a soap bubble. It took a long time to get the nerve to lift my head. I could see my hands and feet and the rest of me. When I moved my fingers, I could see them wriggle. There wasn't a thing wrong with me. It was as if I had never fallen eight stories to be smashed into jelly. I was clothed in a loose white gown that was partly open down the front. Not very surprising, but where was the hospital? Surely they didn't wake sleepers in the middle of a field. They. I couldn't see anyone else. There was a field of dirt trampled here and there, sloping downhill to become a shiny mud flat. I raised my head, and he was standing behind me. A fat man, tall but dumpy and chunky enough that at first I didn't notice his height. His jaw was massively square and jutted out the first thing I noticed about his face. He had wide lips and a high forehead, and short, blunt, powerful fingers. He wore a hospital gown, something like mine. He was beautiful. Everything was beautiful, but my navel, magnifique. You are well? he asked. He spoke with an accent, Mediterranean, Spanish perhaps, or Italian. He was looking closely at me, and he asked again, You are well? Yeah, I think so. Where am I? he shrugged. Always they ask that question first. Where do you think you are? I'll leave it there. Now, obviously, Alan Carpentier, whose real name we find out later is Carpenter, he changed it to make it fancy, is a bit of a douche, bit of an asshole. Um, I read this book long before I was a professional writer, long before I had gone to conventions of any kind. Uh, I do not share Alan Carpentier slash Carpenter's uh, feelings about fans, the, you know, five or six that I have. Uh, but I love the people at conventions, and I love going to them. I will not be doing any drinking in hotel windows, however. You can hold me to that. Mm. I will be drinking on balconies, sure, but places with railings that one cannot fall off of. And if one does, one is only falling to the next floor below. I like to make that clear. Anyway, that's Inferno by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. He can elaborate on a couple of other... Uh, pretty pretty solid genre novels together um most notably uh lucifer's hammer which is sort of the source material for both armageddon and uh deep impact though i would say that the disaster porn of the last hundred or so pages shows up in everything from you know in every post-apocalyptic thing you've ever, apocalyptic thing you've ever read from mad max to uh the walking dead Anyway, I uh, hope you enjoyed that reading from Inferno. Go pick it up. It's a fun book. I have the original paperback. I also have the hardcover, which I believe is revised, and I read it, and I couldn't tell what the revisions were, but I had this vague sense that it wasn't as good as the paperback I had once read. Now, are the changes so small that I was just projecting my own memories onto it, or are there things missing that I loved? Who can say? But anyway, it's a great book. It doesn't talk more than that small bit about uh, fan conventions. But I thought that was a pretty funny, funny intro to San Diego Comic-Con week. Uh, if you're going, come find me and say hi. I can often be found at the bar on the the lobby bar at the Bayfront on Tilton. But otherwise, I have a couple of panels which I'll be posting about on social media. And, you know, buy me a drink. I won't kill myself for you, but I will be grateful. Thanks for listening.